all I can say is that you are in an awesome advertising market. We've got everybody from Lerma to Loomis to Firehouse to uh, Ad Media here with us tonight. We've got just so many wonderful people. So thank you so much. Without further ado, I will introduce who you came to see, which is Alvaro there you go. Duque, yes. uh, the president and CEO of Avocados from Mexico. Uh, in doing some research to prepare for tonight, I was blown away by all the comments from incredible uh, sources and people, such as he's brilliant, he's innovative, he's better than Apple and Google in 2020. Uh, I <laughs> so I, I can't tell you, I am so impressed, and I think you will be as well, with how much uh, he and his team and Avocados from Mexico have changed the entire world of produce. And I don't think we'll ever go back and thank goodness, right? Uh, so thank you so much for coming and I will leave it up to you and we'll have time for some Q&A at the end. But uh, for now, it's all yours. Hello, hello. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. Um, I don't know what you read the Google and, and, and Apple thing, but I want to read that. Yeah. I'll, send uh, I'll send it to you. Yes. So uh, listen, thank you, for, thank you for coming, um, and thank you for, for giving me a little bit of your time to, um, to share the story of uh, avocados from Mexico. Uh, we're very passionate about it, and, and I hope that you like it and, and you get something out of it that will work for your, for your life, for your work, uh, for your uh, student life, because I know that there are some students in here. Um, and um, for us, it's, 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 it's such a proud moment to, to share this uh, with, with all of you. Uh, so first of all, uh, this, is a, this is a story about marketing. Uh, and, um, and this is what we do, right? The, the big M is a very important word for us. Uh, we're a marketing organization. We're a marketing company. And this is, this is what we do every single day. Um, so we're very passionate about this brand and this, and this uh, word. Um, but more than the passion that you can think around marketing, the important thing about this story is that it's a story about transformation and how marketing can transform an industry, can create value, and can create growth, so um, thousands and thousands of people can live better. And, uh, and that's really the story of a, of a good marketing, marketing case. Because at the end, you're going to see it. It's very fun to do ads. It's very fun to be in the Super Bowl. But we're not, we're not, we don't do that because it's fun. We do that because we're trying to make um, something better. The lives of people around us, the world around us. Okay, um, And marketing is very important because marketing um, brings value to organizations. Um, and uh, I'm going to use this, this um, a picture uh, to try to explain a little bit how I see marketing, right? Um, you see there, you have three beautiful dark colas, right? Um, they're refreshing. I'm, a, I'm an addict, so right now I'm, I'm craving one of those, right? Uh, but what if I start asking you which one is better? Which one would you pay a little bit more for? Which one connects a little bit with your emotions and, and your beliefs, right? Which one is a little or hip and, and cooler than the others, OK? It's very hard to answer those questions because we don't know much about it, right? And that's the beauty of marketing. Marketing will give you not only the information that you need to make decisions, but also the information that you need to play with your heart and your emotions. Because at the end, marketing is that collision between the worlds, the two worlds of rational uh, and emotional. And if I put some brands in there, then you can start seeing why marketing is important, right? Now you have a preference. Now you think, well, this one is better than the other. And I like the taste of one more than the other. And I'm willing to pay a little bit more for one than the other. And that's exactly what we want, right? Because if we're good marketers, we're going to be good playing with your mind, and we're going to be good playing with your heart, right? And it's very important to understand that balance between the two worlds, OK? And brands in the US, they do a lot trying to get there. Uh, they, they do Super Bowl ads, and they do endorsements, and they do um, character activations, and promotions, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, experiential programs, and new product developments, and everything else 
that we can have try to try to connect with your heart and your minds. So you can prefer us and you can pay more for our products, okay? Um, and we as marketers, that's exactly what we wanted uh, for avocados from Mexico. The problem is that we have this, <laughs> one product. There's only one SKU in our company. We cannot extend that SKU. We cannot create new products. We cannot create packaging around it. Uh, because of USDA regulations, if you cut that avocado in half before it enters the US, it's not even in our program. We cannot touch it, right? Uh, the best that we can is have the same avocado in a bag of three and four and play with the film around it to try to create some emotions, right? And you can tell me, well, you have a brand in there and you can see avocados from Mexico in there. But the reality is that only 20%, around 20, 25% of the um, avocados that come into the US have that brand 10 years after we started. So it's been super hard to get that brand in the product, okay? Uh, the other thing is that this product, when we started, it was fighting a lot of mental battles that still are there that are very complicated for us. If you see it from the client point of view, they like us, but not that much. Right? Because they want, a clean, they want a clean store policy. They don't want interruptions in their uh, pros aisles. So we come in with those bins and those promotions and those advertisings, and we're the different, the different kid. Right? They, sometimes we're in the way of what they want to do. So it's hard for, them, for us, I'm sorry, to convince them sometimes to take our own promotions to move the category. Okay? Now, if you see it from the consumer point of view, well, not only when you're a consumer, you enter in produce and you, you think that you're entering in a brandless world, so you don't have that mindset that you have when you're buying cookies and, and, uh, and snacks, right? But also someone, and this, this was inherited by us, uh, and, and I love it, but, uh, but it's hard, decided that the brand is gonna be the same as the descriptor of what we are, right? So when you're trying to build up a brand and you ask them, do you know our cows from Mexico? Yes, because you are from Mexico. No, the brand, no, that's the descriptor of where you are from. So it's very hard to build up a brand that is telling you what you are, right? So that battle between an origin and a brand is a very complicated one that we have to deal with when we're trying to build this, okay? And the other big, big problem that we had at the beginning was that when we started this organization, we had 65% of market share, but only 20% of consumer preference. So we were the market leader in volume, but we were not the leader in their minds and their hearts. So we needed to change that, okay? And with all those problems in 2014, we said we'll take the challenge and we'll start this company. Um, the company was completely brand new at that moment and we wanted to create something different for, uh, for the avocado business. Six years after that, um, Fast Company was recognizing us as one of the 100 best companies for innovators in the world. Um, one year after that, we got into the 50 most innovative companies in the world. And we won the branding category over one small brand that I think that you guys know that is called TikTok, okay? Um, so how, right? That's, that's the big question that we have um, uh, to ask ourselves. How a commodity that no one knew about, that cannot have a packaging, cannot have a branding, can transform itself to an emotion that people will prefer, will pay for uh, uh, more, and will really want uh, to have in their, in their homes and their lives, okay? In our case, to get to the brand, we need to understand the business. Uh, and when we started this business, there were three things that for me are fundamental uh, when you're trying to build up an organization, you're trying to build up a brand, okay? The first one, um, it's, uh, it's vision, okay? And when I talk about vision, I mean, uh, you need to understand what's the ground that you're standing on, right? You need to understand where you're starting from very well. Uh, and after that, you need to ask yourself a very important question, that is, why you exist? Every single brand, every single organization has a reason to exist. Uh, and we needed to know that at the beginning when we were launching this organization, okay? The other big question that comes with the vision is, where do you wanna go? What do you wanna do for the years, years to come? And what's gonna be that pathway that you're gonna follow to start developing that business and that brand, okay? So we had those questions. And these are the two organizations that decided to 
to build and, 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 and create our cows for Mexico. We have on one side the Mexican association uh, that is called APEAM, that holds all our growers and packers in Mexico. And then we have on the other side Mejia, that is the organization that holds all our American importers in the US. Okay? And these two organizations decided that they wanted to build us in the middle. And together, we represent a corporation of around $4 billion in sales. So it's, a, it's an important corporation in the US. Okay? The problem is that we manage the same product, we manage the same situation, um, the same non-packaging. Uh, we want to build a brand uh, desire that we wanted, but we are all different, and we have different responsibilities. These guys on this side, they, they pick the product, they grow the product, they send it to the US. The other guys on the other side, they sell it to uh, supermarkets and, and restaurants in the US, and we're in the middle. So our big question was, why? What, are we, what exactly are we? And why we exist in this ecosystem that they created? Uh, and it is very um, fun to see that, that we decided to call ourselves avocados from Mexico, but the reality is that we're not from Mexico, and we don't sell avocados. I don't sell a, a fruit. <laughs> it, it, to, to, to be able to see avocados, I have to come to this conference, and you're going to put the avocados in there. But in our offices, there are no avocados, right, uh, most of the times, because we don't sell a thing. We're a marketing organization, a marketing U.S. organization, okay? So when we ask ourselves why we exist, we decided that we exist because of these two things. And we call it, since the beginning, our dual responsibility. And we said, on one side, we're going to create a brand. And we're going to create equity be, be behind that brand. Because we think that if we do that, we're going to create and sustain value for the future. And I'm going to explain a little bit how we, 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 we did that. On the other side, we said that we wanted to create demand for the avocado business in the US. And if you see there, I'm not saying that we're going to cre create demand for the Mexican avocado business in the US. Because since the beginning, we said, this is not a market share thing. I'm not going to go, when we started the organization, we thought, we're, we're not going to go for the other 35% that we don't have. If it comes along, great. But what I want is to make this pie three times bigger. Um, so we want to expand this category as much as possible. Even by doing that, that I would probably help some of the other uh, origins in the, in, the, in the market to grow, okay? But at the end, it's going to be a benefit for us to have that pie bigger, okay? And then we started creating a pathway, and we said, okay, there are, there are important decisions that we need to make at the, at the beginning that probably are not going to be very popular. Um, the first one was definitely not popular. Um, that was, who are we going to go after at the beginning, right? Uh, and uh, when, when, when I started doing this, almost 11 years ago with this company. I remember every time that we were talking about targets, there was only one word. Nothing else matters, right? It was millennials or die. That's it, right? <laughs> only, that's the only thing that exists, right? Um, and I remember having these big fights saying, we're not going to go after millennials. And why we're not going to go after millennials? Because 10 years ago, millennials were super cool. They're still very cool, because I'm pretty sure that I have a lot here. I have to be careful. <laughs> Right? They're still pretty cool, but at that time, they didn't have money. They were students, right? And they loved avocados. They love avocado toast, big time. But I needed to go to our generation that could buy the avocados, and our generation that I needed to educate in avocados so they can build their kids with this category. Because if you go into baby boomers or Gen X at that time, when they were kids, they, they didn't know what an avocado was. So we needed to do that work first before we get to the, to the crazy millennials, OK? Uh, so we said, OK, we're going to go after that general market. That's going to be our source of growth for the future. Uh, we're going to focus on first on those Gen Xers. We're going to try to have that, that sweet spot between 35 and 45 years old at that moment. But we're not going to forget that 40% of our volume is Hispanic. Um, and we need to defend our ground with the Hispanics. And with Hispanics, it's very interesting because even though they love us and, and, and they, um, they were born like me, we were born with avocados, right? When, when you get to a bicultural stage, you naturally start consuming less of the, of the products that you were born with. Uh, you still love them, but it's natural, right? You're fighting a stomach that now wants to try a lot of different things. So we needed to defend our ground here and grow with the others, 
Okay, the other big decision that we made was, hey, we're gonna go and create a brand, and I'm gonna talk about that, but at the same time that I'm gonna create a brand, I'm gonna own generics for the category. And there, were, there are two very important things around generics in avocados that I'm gonna explain later that were a source of volume, very important source of volume for us, okay? And finally, we said, I'm gonna use these channels. Um, I'm a recipe believer, uh, uh, as far as those recipes are strategically aligned with what we want to do. And that's exactly how we did it. Uh, in, the, in these countries, around 70% of all the uses of avocados goes through four things. Mexican handhelds, American handhelds, guacamole, and salads. So we said, okay, you want to go crazy with recipes? No problem. Go crazy within those four things. Okay? And we're going to start developing the market through those channels. And finally, we're gonna anchor our growth through very important gatherings in the US, events in the US, that definitely avocados are gonna play a, a, a role with, like football, Super Bowl, Cinco, and all the others that we're gonna talk about, okay? We're gonna do that with a personality, because if you're gonna, bring a, if you're gonna build a brand and you're gonna build a company, you need to have an essence. You need to have a personality on how you're gonna look, how you're gonna talk, how you're gonna see, um, and you want people to see you, right? And we call our personality Mexicanity. And, uh, and it's very different from a mariachi, a sombrero, and a mustache. That, that's, that, that's not the Mexicanity that we want, okay? For us, Mexicanity is how to represent the vibrancy, the colorfulness, the, uh, the happiness, the positiveness of the culture that we, where we come from. Okay, so we wanted to be a happy company and a, and a positive company, and that was gonna be our, our way of developing the market. And finally, the other thing that we, what we said is we're gonna anchor our, our growth and our brand into key elements that people will recognize and that we, that we can build our experience our, uh, uh, upon, right? So one of them, I, I think that you know it, that is this one. The jingle, a hit. Right? I cannot, if I, if I start explaining you how many times people have sang that thing to me, <laughs> and in very, very odd places, yeah, it would be a, a full conference just, just on that. Right? They love the, the jingle, right? So we had this great asset with us that we needed to use. And in the past two years, we've been developing another asset that is our color. We, we created our own color, that the color is the combination of an avocado color. Every time that you open an avocado, you will see this this green and yellow combination that is so unique to us, and we were able to register that for our brand. So Avocado Glow is actually a Pantone col color right now that we own and we have. So we think with these type of assets, we we're gonna be able to build a brand for the future, okay? So all of this is vision, right? And trying to put this together. But once you have a vision, you need another very important thing, that is a process. Because if you don't, if you don't have that order on how to um, work, how to develop a company and a brand is going to be very different, very difficult. And for us, we've been, we've been building this process through time. And now we have it in a, in, a, in a place where I feel very confident because we've been trying to do this for many, many years and be consistent with it. Okay? And we call it the wheel. Okay? And the wheel is, is based on four elements. Okay? The first element is strategy and thinking. Right? So we're obsessed on the whys. We want to know why we're doing things. Why? What's the insight? What's the aha moment that triggered a decision? Right? And, uh, and we try to be disciplined on, on being a, a why first company instead of an idea first company. And it's super difficult to do that. If, especially in your marketing, you get excited with ideas. But you need to always go back and ask yourself why you're going to pursue those ideas. And also, the, the strategy is very important because the strategy, strategy is going to define the boundaries of your craziness. Because I love craziness, and I love great ideas within those boundaries, within the boundaries, the playground that the strategy would define. So once you know very well your strategy and the whys, then you can go crazy. And we need to work on that mindset of disruption and try to do things as different as possible. And I love to be first in everything that we can do. We're gonna talk about the Super Bowl, we're gonna talk why we did those crazy things, but it's always based on a strategy, right? And having that discipline of being a strategy first organization. The, the third point that is very important is having the commitment of measuring things. And that outcome uh, has to be very important every time that you go out and bring your craziness and your strategies. 
And if you do this consistently one, over and over and over, you're going to have a culture. Okay? And you're going to start living this process uh, throughout your, um, your life. Okay? And the more that you work on the, on the thinking and the disruption, the more consistent that you're going to be every time that you go out in market. And the more that you work on this performance-driven thinking around that culture, then the more efficient that you will make your, your organization. Right? At the same time, the more that you um, uh, ingrain that, that strategic thinking into your culture, it will make you more intelligent in the way that you are uh, building up your business. But the best combination of all, the one that I like the most is the more you are disruptive and performance driven at the same time, it will give you balance. And for me, that's the key word. If you want to be successful with a company, if you want to be successful with a marketing uh, program, you need that balance. Okay? And the wheel, and I'm going to use here another produce, the wheel is like an onion. Uh, it has layers. And I'm going to show you how it works, right? When you start something, you can do strategy, disruption, and that will open another door where you will do strategy, disruption, and measure, and you can go on and on and on and on. Always with the same, with the same uh, logic. Okay? So let's talk about building a brand using this process. Okay? So when we started thinking about building the brand, one of the things that, that, that we go, went back and, and analyzed were, okay, let's, let's think about our consumers and what they're, they're thinking, they're feeling when they're, they're getting close to the category. Um, the first is, is, is this side of, of the slide, right? Um, this person, I'm pretty sure that um, will be very, very marketing driven if, if she turns back and have all the sodas and, and crackers and snacks in front of, of her. And, and it's a person that will be crazy about those brands. But when, when she gets into the produce business, she's not thinking about that. Right? And we have to be honest. Uh, no one in this audience, including me, wakes up one day and says, wow, this is it's Wednesday. This is the day that I'm going to go after my best celery brand that I love so much. Right? <laughs> but that doesn't exist. Right? Uh, or, or onions or carrots or anything else. Right? So, so your mind, even if you are a marketer and you love, you love marketing, when you get there, you're in a different mindset. Right? Uh, so we needed to understand that. The second part is, the, the few brands that were saying something about their marketing efforts in, in the produce world, they were following like the same, same uh, uh, practice. They were saying, if you see the ads of all those brands, it was the same thing. Blue skies, perfect green fields, three generations of growers running through the fields with the kids, right? And at the end, they have a beautiful apple, right? Uh, so it was the same, 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 same old. And we have that story because uh, I don't know if you know this, and we're going to have maybe time to talk about it, but uh, Michoacan is the only place on planet Earth that we grow avocados full year, from January to December. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the planet. Okay, so, so we have a magical story on why this happens, but we decided to ignore that story. And we decided not to talk about trees or, or uh, uh, volcanoes or perfect soil or perfect weather and water. And we decided to create this, to create a brand based on emotions. And we said we want to be the Pepsi of produce in the US. Okay? So that was a very strong statement to have at that time. And that's the first layer of the onion. When you decide to, to build up a brand, it's great. But now it comes a, the second layer. What are you going to say? What's, what's the communication behind that brand so people can listen and really pay attention to what you're, you're trying to do? And this is where the trifecta comes in. There's a, we, we've been perfecting as much as possible this idea of the power trifecta behind our, our brand. And, and I'm going to try to explain how we see it. Okay? Uh, you're all consumers, and I'm a consumer as well. Right? So uh, we're, we don't compromise. We want all. Um, so if, if, if I go and I, and I um, uh, bump with you guys in the supermarket, I'm pretty sure that uh, in some part of your card you will have this. because. Uh, you want to be healthy and you want to take care of yourself. So you're going to have those type of brands in your cart. But at the same time, you crave and you want to have that, right? Uh, because they, they taste great and, uh, and they have a lot of calories, but, but we love them, right? And at the same time, you want to remember your childhood or have a great time and you want to have fun. So you have all those brands in your cart as well, okay? So we believe that avocados from Mexico can't deliver the three things at the same time, okay? It is very hard 
to control yourself when you're in front of a bowl of wok. Uh, you really want to eat it all, right? So it's delicious. No, no argue with that, okay? The crazy and, and, and amazing thing for us is that people eat that bowl of guacamole thinking that they're healthier, right? Because avocados, no, they are good for the heart. They have good fats. So they have a different moment in their mind. And, and that healthiness comes naturally for us, okay? But at the same time, we're highly related to fun moments because usually you have that moment watching your, your favorite uh, football team or at the Super Bowl or Cinco de Mayo or a party, New Year's, and everything else. So we have that combination of fun, healthiness, and flavor at the same time. And using that, we created this, this strategy that we call Always Good, okay? And that's our, our main brand position that we're using right now. And we are always good because we're always tasting good, because we're always good for you, because we're always delivering a good time, okay? Uh, and the way that we've been trying to develop this in the market is by enforcing and, and promoting and, and, and pushing that, that goodness around our brand in everything that we do, right? So we try to be as consistent as possible in that goodness message that we have out there, okay? Now, we need to face reality when we're doing these type of things. Um, within produce, we are Pepsi in the US. This is the number one marketing organization for produce in the US. So in that world, yes, we are the big guys. But we decided to be a brand. And you're building brands in the, in, the, in the food business, not in the produce world. So if you go into the food business, we are very, very, very small fish in that pond. So if we do a lot of these great campaigns and a lot of consistency in the message, still it's going to be very hard for us to get noticed because there are so many other brands that are much bigger than us trying to take that, uh, that place, okay? So that's why we decided at some point to go to the Super Bowl. And why the Super Bowl? The Super Bowl is something very, very unique and very special uh, that, that only exists in this country. Um, the Super Bowl gives you, for one day, the power of being equal, right? Um, you, doesn't matter if you're a small cor corporation, doesn't matter if you are a fruit, you that day are right beside Budweiser, right beside Coca-Cola, right beside the big guys, okay? So when we decided to get into the Super Bowl, it was a one-time thing, because at that time we were um, uh, starting the company, and we said, okay, let's go to the Super Bowl, because we needed to hit the table and tell everyone, this is our house from Mexico, we have 65% of this market, and we're gonna build a brand, uh, pay attention. That's basically what we wanted, okay? Um, and it was, I thought, a very hard decision to make at that, at that moment because it's not easy for a corporation our size at that moment to decide to pay more than $4 million for 30 seconds, right? But we did it, okay? And, uh, and the idea was that people will notice and start talking about us. And it worked perfectly, right? Um, nobody was expecting us. Nobody was expecting a brand, a, a, a produce brand, a fruit a Mexican-related product to, um, to, to get into the Super Bowl. We were the underdog, uh, and we play with that love that people have around avocados. So from one moment to the other, a brand that nobody knew about was in Forbes, CNN, CNBC, uh, 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 Ad Age, Ad Week, Fast Company, all the big names were talking about us. And we became noticed, okay? So it worked great for us. Um, the, the thing is that we would never imagine that the Super Bowl will come with very important learnings that will transform this organization for the future, okay? The first big learning that we saw in the Super Bowl was that um, we can actually use the Super Bowl in a different way. After, after going the first round and, and getting all that, that attention in, in, in the game, um, we said, what if we go back to the Super Bowl but instead of using the Super Bowl to launch a product, to launch a flavor, to launch a campaign like most of the big guys do, what if I use the Super Bowl to build up a brand story? And every time that I come back into the Super Bowl, I start building up in what I want to build for this brand because it's going to be the time that everyone's going to pay attention to me. And that's exactly what we did. So we went back to the Super Bowl in 2016 and started talking about fun and uh, that we were fun the full year round and we were all, always in season. 
And the following year, we went back and started talking about healthiness and uh, good fats. And the third year, we went back and started talking about versatility and deliciousness. So the trifecta that we wanted to build for the brand, we built it up on Super Bowl events. Um, and once we, we had those three things out there, we've been reinforcing that idea of trifecta and now always good into the Super Bowl. Okay, so that was a game changer for, for our organization. The second big learning that we had is that we can actually use the Super Bowl in a different way, not only to build up a brand, but to do it as, a, as an excuse to develop a campaign. Uh, if you see a Super Bowl ad, um, 30 seconds, probably right now more than $6 million, it will give you 115 million impressions. Uh, you will never, ever, ever pay for that. It's going to be read 100% from beginning to end, right? And if you're big and a big corporation, you can pay for it. But if you're a small corporation, you have to be careful with those reds, okay? But if you see the Super Bowl as an excuse to develop a campaign, ah, that's very interesting, right? Because that's the moment where people is going to pay attention. And why is, why is important? Because we're oversaturated with messages. We know, all, all know that, right? Uh, I think that the number is between 5,000 and 10,000 messages a day that we are um, uh, receiving, right? And most of those, what? We don't pay, even pay attention to them, right? Because it's too much for our lives. But the dangerous thing is not that. The dangerous thing is the, the, um, um, the, the behavior that we have started to see in our consumers against our advertising, right? I don't know which uh, professions we have here, but for sure we have professors, right? Like, 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 like Joe, right? So. Um, Imagine that you study your whole life to become a professor. You, you come to your class and you find out that your students are taking money out of their pockets every month, every, every month to pay not to see you and not to listen to you. That's exactly what is happening to us marketers. People are paying Spotify, they're paying Hulu, they're paying Netflix not to see what we do. There are more than 75 million people with ad blockers in the US. So it's harder and harder for us as marketers to deliver the message that we want to deliver, okay? But there's one poison pill to all of that. And it, for me, it's called the Super Bowl effect, right? And what's the Super Bowl effect? Well, all those crazy guys like me that we pay every single month to, uh, to have the non-ad subscriptions, when it gets to the Super Bowl, it flips 100%. And everyone wants to see the ads. Everyone wants to talk about the ads. Everyone wants to share the ads, right? So that mindset completely changes. And that's the opportunity. If we see the opportunity of, of someone paying attention, this is the moment that we needed to hit. So the way that we work this extension of our campaign is, is something like this. For example, this is, this is the, the last ad that we did uh, a year ago in the Super Bowl. And and some extensions that we usually do for, for the ads, okay? So if we, if we roll this ad, like I told you, 150 million um, impressions, and that's it, right? But what if I use that ad as an excuse to develop a, a digital campaign that will last for three or four weeks, and I will deliver probably three to four billion impressions with that campaign, okay? But at the same time, that digital campaign can help me out extend my campaign to billboards, like we did in, uh, New, York, um, in, in New York, uh, could help me out to uh, potentialize my e-commerce platforms to sell more avocados during the Super Bowl. And now that we're talking about selling, I can use the um, Super Bowl excuse to create a, a, a shopper campaign, that this shopper campaign delivered more than 100,000 equivalized bins into the stores, 100,000 more opportunities to sell avocados in the stores, and all of these together can be great fuel for our PR team to deliver news. And we have a cadence in PR that starts in October up to the Super Bowl that delivered in this last Super Bowl 12 billion impressions. So now a Super Bowl of one ad of 150 million, 150 million impressions became a campaign of 15 billion impressions for the brand, okay? And that formula, is the one that we have used to build up this organization. So in eight Super Bowls, we've been, we've been able to deliver more than 55 billion impressions for a very small brand, okay? Impossible to do without the Super Bowl, okay? And finally, the last learning that we got for the Super Bowl was very fun, that we said, well, 
you cannot only use the Super Bowl to build up a brand. You cannot use the Super Bowl uh, as an excuse to multiply your impressions and your, uh, your um, um, engagement. You can actually win the damn thing. And how, how, how are we going to win the Super Bowl, right? Um, and this was something very, very revealing, the first Super Bowl that we did. We came out with this ad, and we had a digital campaign that was nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. But Adobe did an analysis of the first uh, Super Bowl that we participated, and they said our house for Mexico was the second best digital campaign of the Super Bowl after Procter & Gamble. And we said, hmm, all right, here's something interesting. We can u actually use technology and uh, digital to, to build up a brand that is a fruit. Nobody would expect that a commodity, a fruit, brandless, will have a punch in, in the digital and technological world. But we went back and said, okay, let's start testing and let's, let's, let's put ourselves that, that goal that we want to win the digital Super Bowl. Um, and we went back and created this campaign in, in, 20, in 2016 and it was an extended campaign. So we were now playing with different, different um, um, uh, channels, a way to do it. We created our own um, uh, uh, brand ambassadors to help us out big time. We started dominating the conversation pre-game getting those headlines. So we said, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. We used the, the Merkel report. That was the best report of the Super Bowl to, to measure um, who, who can win. And uh, uh, TurboTax took the first place. And we took the second place again. OK? Uh, so we said, OK, no problem. We'll go back. OK? And we went back, and we created another experience in 20, 2017 when we were mixing up all their social media. We actually created uh, a platform where we were we, we can take over your phone during the Super Bowl, and you can have all your apps. We really, it was our apps uh, working together to create millions and millions and millions of impressions uh, around our, our, our brand. And we, we dominated the conversation again, and we got all the headlines that we wanted. We brought comedians uh, two, three days after, uh, before the Super Bowl to run our, our, our social media uh, community management at that time. And it was amazing. We said, we're going to win it, and we came second again. This time, T-Mobile got the first, the first uh, uh, place. So we went back, right? And we created Wag World. And Wag World was this world where you connected all the different worlds. We had even um, um, partnership brands with us. We, we created, at that time, Tabasco was our partner for, uh, for the Super Bowl. We created the Tabasco world within our Wag World. And you can connect each world through social media, through videos. Uh, different platforms. It was amazing, the, the dynamic that we, that we had. And we won the Super Bowl. And we got the first place over big brands, big brands that had way more budget than us. Okay? So we got that one. It was great. We celebrated, right? Uh, and, and, and there was something that we wanted. But at the end, that's not really the value out of it. The value out of it is that it opened up our minds that innovation was something very important for this organization. And if we kept on innovating, especially in the digital and technological world, nobody would expect that. And we will always create those headlines and those engagements that we wanted from our consumers, our media, our clients. And that's what we have done throughout these years. Um, we were um, not only the first ones to take um, black, uh, 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 blockchain and, uh, and I.B. Watson to the Super Bowl, we uh, we went to South by Southwest twice and dominated the conversation. We participated, let me tell you this, we participated in Macy's Parade because it was the second most important uh, uh, TV uh, program or, or, or event uh, in the US. And we said, we're going to go in uh, Macy's Parade and hijack the Macy's Parade from the digital world. Our hashtag was bigger than Macy's in the Macy's Parade, right? <laughs> Uh, so we, we did amazing things uh, because people were not expecting that an avocado could do that, okay? Uh, and this has been fundamental to build up a brand. And now we are in that stage where we believe that we have a strong brand. And we have a brand that is a staple in the Super Bowl, that we, people expect us to be there, and that we have something to say, and that people are waiting for us to say it, okay? Now let me put the same example on the other side. We said we're going to build a brand and we're going to create uh, demand. So when we're creating demand, the same thing. We needed a strategy, right? And what was the strategy when we were uh, thinking about volume? And we said we want to become that CPG of produce, 
like I said, we want to we want to be the Coca Cola of produce, right? and we're going to do all the different stunts that we know because most of our company comes from CPG. Uh, and after we build the organization, I've, I've been obsessed to try to bring talent from CPG to produce because we can bring a lot of the knowledge that I want from CPG into the produce world. Um, and we wanted to have that mentality, all right? So the first thing that we did is, okay, let's, let's, bring, pro, let's bring CPG into produce, right? Uh, these, all these brands are, are crazy uh, to get into produce. So we were very popular trying to um, uh, uh, partner with them because they all wanted to be part of, of produce. And we started building up our uh, promotional program around these huge brands uh, that wanted to have a stake into, into our business, okay? And we did that um, through very important times uh, uh, throughout the year. Hispanic Heritage Month, Super Bowl, football season, Cinco de Mayo, summer, key moments in time where we can bring those partnerships and start building up all these great promotions that no one has done in, in produce. So we became the brand that did everything that no one has done in this industry. And if you're a CPG guy, you will say, yes, we did this 15 years ago. Yes, 100%. That's the beauty of it, right? We were bringing all the things that we knew that worked already in, pro in, in CPG, that we know that, that will have traction into an industry that haven't seen them, right? So we were always first in everything that we were doing, okay? The second source of volume that was very important for us uh, was generics. I told you we were gonna, I was gonna tell you a little bit about generics. So when we started this organization, we did research and there were two things that were very, very important for, for avocados. Uh, one is what's the most important barrier of avocados and it's education, right? Um, people still have one question that is almost impossible to respond. Uh, what should I do with the other half? Right? Uh, most of the times you eat half an avocado and you don't know what to do with the other half. That's the biggest question that you can have around avocados. So there was a lot to do around education because this is a big barrier for us. But every single avocado in the US will have the same issues. It doesn't matter if they come from Peru, Colombia, California, or Mexico, they will have the same situation. Now the number one driver of the category was health and wellness. If we, if we tell them that we have good fats and we're good for the heart, they will come. That's the number one reason why they get into the category. But again, I'm not healthier than, an, than a California avocado or a, or a Peruvian avocado, right? So we decided to take on this, this uh, 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 challenge of creating volume through generics, even though we're gonna help our competition. Um, and, and we did it very well. So, so we, uh, first again, the, the will, we created a strategy uh, around education. We knew that the three most important things are how to pick, how to preserve, and how to ripen avocados. And then we disrupted. We created, for example, for avocados, we became partners with Walmart, and we've been partners with them for the last seven, eight years, uh, educating avo uh, avocado uh, users in the US. We have done with them everything that you can imagine, okay? And the people that are here sitting are really the ones who have done all, all the magic uh, in, in this, okay? And if you go into, into health and wellness, the same thing. We created a strategy first, and with the strategy, when we went out and disrupted the market, disrupted with things that this category has never, this industry, I'm sorry, has never seen, okay? So we have promotions and CPGs, and we have um, uh, generics. The third big source of volume that we use is, is culinary uh, experience, right? And, um, when I'm talking about culinary experience, yes, recipes are very important. Uh, and like I told you, I'm a believer of recipes and I love recipes as far as they match my strategy, right? And uh, so we try to be very consistent in the recipes that we create around the core uses that we have, okay? But more than recipes, because recipes, anyone can do recipes in the world, right? But it's very hard to create experiences. Uh, and we've been trying to create those experiences around our culinary capabilities. We were the ones to create the first um, avocado Polish casual restaurant in the world here in Dallas. We had it open for, for two, two years. We created Avo Eats, that is our concession program <clears throat> that we have in Dallas, Miami, Boston, uh, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, <clears throat> I'm sorry. And we created uh, also a program with Kitsania to educate kids for the future, okay? And we do also all that in our own laboratory. We have 
what we call our Avo Lab in, in Dallas. And we bring uh, our clients here to Avo Lab to innovate, to think different, to create recipes, to create um, new ideas with us. And we even have Avocado University that is the only certified education for avocados in the world, okay? And just because you're probably hungry, I'm gonna play a little bit of what we do because we have our rings in, in studio in, uh, in Avocado Lab. So that's the beauty of, uh, of being a, a culinary expert and a marketer, that you can use your culinary capabilities to create uh, this type of ideas. I make you hungry. Hungry. Okay, so we, we talked about vision, we talked about process. What's the third one? The third one is, is commitment. Um, and commitment is very important because commitment represents our, our, our um, part of the wheel that is all about outcomes and results, right? And it's very important, like I told you, because it's all about value and growth. Uh, if you're a marketer, I don't know if you we have students here that are studying marketing or advertising, you need to learn that. If, uh, if you really want to do well in the future, you need to understand that marketing is not a fancy thing to do ads and promotions. Marketing is a, is a, is a business machine. We need to use marketing to deliver value and growth. If you don't do that, we're not doing our job right, okay? And we do it in, in, in several ways. We, we have our own research practices that we use to be sure that everything, every single asset that we, that we have is delivering in value and in brand. Uh, but also we created our own measurement platform to be sure that every employee is accountable for, for what they do. We, we use OKRs to, uh, to um, uh, measure performance of our, of our company, and we are following every single program that we do. And I can tell you, I work in several uh, organizations in, 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 in different parts in the world. I've never seen the effectiveness that we have in Avocado from Mexico. I think that OKRs work 100%. Okay, and if you do that, like I told you at the beginning, you're gonna create a culture, guys. Um, and the culture is very important because the culture is gonna, it's gonna uh, push you to ask you the other question. I told you at the beginning, when you're building up a company, when you're building up an organization, you need to ask yourself why you exist. When you're building up a culture, you need to ask yourself why you matter. Because it's, it's very different to have a business purpose than to have an inspirational purpose. Uh, and uh, we work together, we're a small organization, so we had the uh, opportunity of getting everyone together into one room, work with different uh, workshops, and define what's gonna be that purpose that is gonna move the organization forward. And we decided that this is our purpose. Our purpose is to nurture hearts uh, to live life deliciously. And, uh, and I love this because it's a, it's, a, it's a play of words, right? Uh, I, I nurture hearts because I make you healthier, I, I make you live your life deliciously because I'm tasteful and, and delicious, but at the same time, I nurture your heart and make your life deliciously because I try to make your life better. And I, to, and I try to make your moments better in life, right? So our purpose has the perfect representation of our trifecta, fun, health, and, and, uh, and deliciousness, right? Uh, and we, we are building up that, that culture around very important values that we have in the organization that have that balance that we want between performance and, and, and emotions, right? So, like I told you, vision, process, and commitment, right? Uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the way to do it. Uh, but if you really wanna be successful, don't forget about this word, right? Balance is, is the key, right? Because at the end, Creativity needs accountability, guys. Um, and uh, I was, I was uh, listening to a podcast uh, la last week, and they had this, this concept. I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but I loved it, uh, about being a Renaissance man or a Renaissance marketer, right? Uh, when, when Leonardo da Vinci uh, was so successful during the Renaissance, uh, he couldn't answer if he was a scientist, a mathematician, or an artist, because he was so good at everything. That's the marketer that we want. 
the one that is good at performance, is good at creativity, that has that balance for the future, okay? So using that formula, we came to very nice results after our, our 10th uh, anniversary. We were able to build up a brand that now is not only a brand, it's a staple in the Super Bowl. People are waiting for us to participate in there. We were able to quadruple our, our brand awareness uh, in, in the market. Uh, and while we were doing that, something very important, we sustain value. Right now, the category is selling in a higher price than, than when we started 20 or 10 years ago, okay? And the other thing is that, remember I told you, we had an issue at the beginning. We were not the preferred brand in the mind of, uh, of consumers. We were able to triple our brand uh, preference to become by far the, pref the preferred brand of our cows in the US, okay? On the other hand, we said we're gonna deliver value, a uh, volume. And in volume, we were able to double our market in seven years, 100% in, in volume. Uh, we're now close to that 2.5 billion mark that, that we wanna cross. Uh, and at the same time, we were able to grow our, our menu penetration in 20%, grow our velocity in 19% in retail, and now more than 70% or close to 70% of our households in the U.S. Uh, consume avocados, right? Thanks to that, we can say that more than eight avocados out of 10 in the U.S. are Mexican. And the, the greatest thing of all is that the U.S. today is the number one consumption com uh, country in the world for avocados, okay? But more than all those data and numbers, guys, the, the most important thing is that we are taking care of families. This is a business that is now $11 billion in economic output uh, for, uh, for the US. And we are giving uh, jobs to more than 58,000 people in the US, more than 78,000 people in Mexico, and more than 300 people uh, every time that we come into a Super Bowl, okay? So we were able to do that with a company of less than 35 people, right? Um, why? Because we had that discipline since the beginning and that vision and that commitment and that process to make it happen, okay? Now, that's the story of the 10 years, but it doesn't, start, it doesn't stop there, right? Uh, now we need to have another 10 successful years. So, so what's coming? What, what are we seeing for the future? Uh, to end the, the presentation, I, I, I really wanna have this commitment of becoming the most innovative produce brand in the world. Uh, and um, I think that we're there, we're very close to it. We, we've won things that no other produce brand has, has won, has been recognized uh, around. And we're still doing crazy things. I don't know if you saw this, but we just launched our, our artificial intelligence tool for the Super Bowl. So you can um, uh, take a picture of any uh, ingredients that you have in your house and the tool will give you a guacamole recipe in 60 seconds, 100% personalized with names, with instructions on how to do it, and with pairings if you wanna pair it with different, different type of chips or, 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 or vegetables, okay? The same thing, we're, we're, we're just uh, uh, working on launching this, this great new idea that, that we have. Um, it's called Wack Heaven, uh, because what could be better for heaven that it's full of guacamole, right? So, um, <laughs> So WAC Heaven is gonna be launching in, in May and it's an interactive experience that we have, again, full of technology around it. We're gonna have AI, virtual reality, uh, recipe creation, robots, everything that you can imagine uh, in, this, in this place, okay? Now the second big thing that we're seeing for the future is that remember that I told you I was ignoring millennials at the beginning. I cannot ignore them anymore. Right? They, they grown up. Uh, and, uh, and now is the time, these next uh, 10 years, to look at the other generations, right? To think different. It's the time for millennials and Gen Cs to take over, right? Uh, we did our job with the, with the Gen Xers. I hope that, that we, we, did it, we did it well, but now we need to change. And, uh, and with these new uh, generations, there's something that is very, very important for us that is this commitment to sustainability. Uh, um, and, and it's something that we really want to work on we want to get better at. Um, and um, we've been working with, uh, with different organizations to try to get to our, to our sustainability framework that we're gonna hopefully launch very soon. We're gonna be committing to um, how to uh, make better our land, our environment, and our people around, uh, around our business, okay? And if we do that, well, at the end, we end up with the story of goodness, right? We're, we're good, and that's, that's what we do. Our, our job in this, in this world is to make you happy. Right? Uh, there are many companies that have these um, um, social and political 
uh, um, 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 forces that they, they do well with it and people like it and consumers like it. We try to get as far as possible from those conversations because we believe that our job in the world is to make you happy and healthy. That's it, right? Um, and, and to do that and to be uh, true to our, to our um, uh, promise, we're now uh, experimenting a lot with cost marketing. And, and one, of the, one of the things that we like a lot is, is, is supporting uh, Susan G. Komen. We actually became the number one uh, uh, produce brand uh, program for Susan G. Komen ever in their history. Um, this is our third year supporting the cause, and we've been, we've been getting more and more and more and more traction around it. And we want to keep this for the long, long run. And now we, we are thinking on developing a second one that we are probably going to launch very, very soon. Okay, so a story of making you healthy and happy by doing good. Okay, so I want to close my presentation. Don't take more time out of you guys with a manifesto, manifesto that we build out for the company on why we think that we're good. What's everything behind our brand, our product, our, 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 our marketing uh, uh, that we have built that now is trying to deliver that, that message of goodness for you and for generations in the future. So thank you for listening to me. Hope you like it and hope that this uh, work out for you guys. And I am always good. I am a freshly made bowl of guacamole that others orbit around at a party. I am a slice of added goodness. I am that topping that turns it up a notch. I am extra, but always worth it. I am avocados from Mexico, and I am always good. I don't just follow the fun, I take it up a level. I am down for brunch, up for late night snacks, in for movie night, or out on the town. I am smooth, silky, and can always spark a good time all year round. And oh yeah, I've got super good fats and nutrients. <laughs> Try to top that. Avocados from Mexico, and I am always good. I am not just a fruit that grows on trees. I am an energy, a vibe, a groove. I am a smile that makes others feel welcome. I am avocados from Mexico, and I am always good. From Mexico, it's not just in my name, it's in my soul. It's in my heritage. It's what makes me able to deliver freshness all year long. It's what makes me an authentic brand that can make you want to sing just by saying my name. I am Avocados from Mexico, and I am always good. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, I'll grab a microphone, but wow, he's brilliant. Thank you. Come on over. Do you have your water? I have my water, yes. All right. It was so mind-blowing. I love how you went with the strategy in every domain. I mean, the Timberland Advertising Institute, we focus on three tracks. We focus on strategic brand management, mm -hmm. and we focus on media, and we focus on creative. And uh, I even had students tapping me over there saying, that's us. He's, he's, he does all of it, oh my gosh. And uh, each student usually focuses on one track. And so the fact that you have just gone, against, uh, gone across the whole gamut is amazing. Um, I love how you said, we want to be the Pepsi of produce, but then you didn't stop. We want to go on and we want to be the, uh, for, for the entire food category. Yeah. We want to be <laughs> the thing. So I think it's fascinating. So I guess, we have lots of questions, I'm sure, in the audience, but I want to start with one, and that is, even where did the avocados from Mexico name? I mean, let's just go back to the very beginning. Uh, you talked about so much strategy and, and just this growth of 10 years, which is incredible, but I kind of just want to know, where did the name come from in the first place? Were you just sitting around? Well, um, <laughs> that, one, that one was inherited 100%, right? Uh, um, when, when I started um, Avocados from Mexico, the organization, the brand was already there. Um, these two parent companies that we have, they've been doing marketing in the U.S. for seven to eight years with using that brand. So they were the ones who decided to use it. And I think that, that they were um, 
trying to uh, to 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 tie it up to to our origin, right? Uh, and uh, and maybe at that time they didn't think that it was so complicated to build up a brand that is a descriptor. Uh, but, uh, but we've, we've taken the challenge, and I think that there has been a, it's been an, an amazing ride. And are, is there any concern that uh, another produce could come along from Mexico and say we're, uh, I guess we could go with mangoes, or we could go with dragon fruit from Mexico? Yes. I mean, they couldn't use the jingle. Well, uh, <laughs> that's a funny story. I, I, some years ago, um, I had some guys from an organization in Mexico that represents several vegetables, uh, tomatoes, very important. Um, and they wanted to come to our offices to understand what we did, right, and how we did it. So I, I, I took him through the whole thing. We, we knew some of the guys. It was perfect, nice meeting, great. Like a month after that, I saw that they launched veggies from Mexico, right? So, so I said, oh, okay, now, now they, they got the, the, the thing, right? Um, so, no, we don't see it as an issue. Um, we are, um, I don't know if, if you guys know how we are funded, but uh, the way that we are funded, it's very, it's very unique. Uh, we're, we're a check, uh, check-off program. And in, in the U.S., there are several check-off programs that are programs that the U.S. decides, the government decides, that they want to promote through marketing activities so that people can consume more, right? So uh, milk, for example, is one very, very popular, right? All the God Milk campaigns that you've seen in, in your life, that, that's a check-off program, okay? So uh, we have that from the U.S. side. But this alliance that, that, that happened be, before us be, between these two organizations gave us the opportunity of having all the funds from Mexico as well in our program. So that's very unique. Actually, I don't know any other produce company that can have all the power of Mexico and all the power of uh, the U.S. and the government uh, in one budget, in one organization. So they can do a lot, but, but it's, it's going to be hard for them to match. Um, our, our thing. And what you've done, though, is such a benefit to, to, like you had said, in the economy of Mexico and the growers and the economy here and the jobs. I mean, it's just escalated. And I love how you went into all these different avenues where you keep innovating guacamole and innovating avocados into recipes and all these other brands that now have a stake yes. in yours. So Yeah, yeah, we, we see that, right? We want to be true to our brand, but we think that culinary experience is, is something very, very interesting, and we've been very successful creating these experiences around the U.S. Um, obviously, in each one of them, we, we support the Avocados for Mexico brand, but we want to be sure that people think that, that, that there's something different. Every time that they go into an Avo Eats in a stadium, it's a different uh, experience than if they go to Kitsania or they go to the Avo Lab, or they visited our Avo Eatery when we had it open as a restaurant, right? So, so it's, it's, we're creating those experiences because we believe that people want that, uh, and that will make them come some more. Well, and how many people here tonight, just show your hands, tried uh, an avocado in something you had never tried it with before? I had avocado with a cucumber. It looked like a sushi roll, sort of. Yeah, I mean, amazing. I'm, I'm inspired. I want to go buy them for this weekend and do something. Yeah, that's, you know what, it's, it's, it's fun because uh, we have half of our company are Mexicans and they're hard Mexicans, right? So when they come to the U.S. and they see us doing those crazy things with pineapples, I think they're like, ah, no, 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 no. Cilantro, onion, and, and lime, that's it, right? Um, but I, I've learned to love those combinations. And actually, I'm going to give you my, my recipe. Uh, when, you're, when you're, if you, uh, these, these guys are still there, try this. Try uh, guacamole pistachios, uh, dried cranberries, and cotija cheese at the same time. Uh, yeah. It's going to be amazing, right? And it's a, a great combination that no one will have in their minds. Well, that's the beauty. We see guacamole as a canvas. You can, you can bring your own creativity around it and create whatever you want. Amazing. I know everybody is already probably drooling, but we're going to hold off because I want to hear some questions from the audience, and I know there's definitely some out there. So. Anybody want the microphone and have a few questions? Oh, I see one right in front of me. Yeah, you were easy. There you go. <laughs> Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Welcome to Dallas. Um, I have a question for you. So yeah. the last six years, I've been in the Middle East, and constantly I would hear, oh, those avocados are not from Mexico. No, sorry. Uh -huh. What is your, or what is the company's vision to take it abroad? I was based in Abu Dhabi. 
and uh, constantly I would say, the Emiratis would say, no, no, from Mexico, not from other countries. Yes. Ah. So, um, so I, I have I have the same the same situation. I'm I'm not Mexican actually. I'm Costa Rican. Okay. Um, so Puerto every time Vida. that I go to Costa Rica, <laughs> it's the first thing that, that they tell me, "Where are the avocados from Mexico?" Uh, I cannot control that because uh, part of being a checkoff program is that I have very important regulations. We we report directly to the government in the United States, right? So. Um, Part of their regulations is that we cannot do absolutely anything outside of the border. So uh, everything, 100%, has to be in the U.S. Um, so the Mexican parent company that we have, uh, uh, PAM, they have uh, marketing programs in Canada, in Japan, in some parts of Central America, but it's not, it's not the same as, as the U.S. But uh, maybe if they change the law at some point, we will be able to, 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 to do something abroad. Abu Dhabi is ready. Yes. Abu Dhabi evidently is ready, and I would expect that the USDA would also be ready, given that the amount of money that has come in yes. uh, from this uh, venture, that it would only expand going outside the US as well. Oh, all right. Other people, we've got, oh, I've got a hand, all right. And we have McKenna, one of our fabulous students at SMU. Oh, thank you, Ron, all the way. <laughs> So my question basically was, your brand has done an amazing job with its positioning and making sure that personality does shine through, or like you said, Mexican. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it, but Mexican personality yes. shine through. Um, so how do you make sure that your product stands out in a retail setting compared to other, other produce? Yeah, well, um, the, ma the, the, the magician around that um, question is, is actually sitting there, right? Um, uh, we have an amazing shopper and, and trade um, department that they do crazy things around our, our product to stand out. Um, now, let me be honest. Um, I told you, I think that the formula that we've been following is not that it's easy, but it's kind of have a, a little bit of, of, of easiness around it because um, we take everything that we know from CPG, everything that is working in CPG, everything that we have done in our past lives and bring it to an industry that haven't seen it. This industry is 15 years behind in some things, right? So when we come with these big programs, we were the first ones to, to organize the digital shelf for, or for Walmart. Uh, Imagine that giant that probably is, has been working in digital shelves and e-com with CPG companies for many, many years. No one has done that in produce. So we're, we're able to take all those um, um, uh, learnings and apply it. And it's kind of easy of, for us to stand out because no one else is doing it. Thank you. Excellent. I think we had a neighbor question. <laughs> Um, so you guys are mainly in retail space, from my understanding. Are you guys wanting to like become main suppliers for like Chipotle or Cava or that side, like become a supplier side, or are you guys already suppliers for like fast food chains, like fast casual chains? Uh, around 35% of all the volume that comes into the U.S. goes to food service. We have a full division of food service that that does exactly the same thing that I told you guys on retail, but on the food service side. Uh, we do a lot of promotions. Actually, in the next two weeks, if I'm not mistaken, we're, we're coming out with a big promotion with Chipotle, uh, giving away free wax, so watch out, okay, if you are wax lovers in Chipotle. Um, so there's a lot that we do on the, on the food service side. And actually, if you ask me, I still believe that the, that the most important source of volume that we have for the future is food service, it's not, it's not retail. retail it's been driving the volume for, for many years. But uh, right now, we have 100% ACV. It's, it's hard to go to a supermarket and not find avocados. That's not going to happen, right? But if you see avocados in, soup, in, in, in food service, there's still so much to grow with there. We did a study like five years ago, and um, tacos, for example, that we're, 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 we're coming from Mexico. Tacos are coming from Mexico. So we're a natural uh, uh, match, right? Uh, Every single taco in the world could have an avocado and it will be great. Do you know the avocado penetration in tacos in the U.S.? It's 2%. 98% of all the tacos in the U.S. don't have avocados in them, right? So the opportunity is huge on the food service side. 
and we're doing amazing things with our team to make it to make it happen. Wonderful. Do I see another hand? Oh, I, you're going to make me work for this, are you, Ben? All right. <laughs> All right, I'm coming. I'm getting my steps in. All right, another one of our fabulous students. Thank you, Dr. LaPearl. Um, honestly, this is a bit of a selfish question. I'm currently working on the National Student Advertising Competition, um, where our client is tied. Um, and I see a lot of overlaps between um, it and avocados, just because uh, it's one of those things that laundry is one of those things people don't really think about um, unless they will put the piles up and they have to do it, which kind of like produce is one of those things people don't really think about. And you have to kind of make them think about it before you can get them to actually buy. Um, so with that, I was looking at um, your Always Good, and I kind of want to ask you a little bit more about Always Good and how it kind of aligns all the different aspects of avocados. Can, so can you speak a little bit more to Always Good and the power of it to kind of unify your brand? Yeah, totally. Um, it's, um, we, we, we see Always Good as our brand positioning, and Always Good represents the, the power of bringing to life the trifecta that for us is so important, right? We think that we're always good because we're always delivering a tasty experience. We're always good because we're delivering always a healthy experience. And we're always good because we're, you're having fun with us every time that you do it. So we're trying in every, in every um, 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 program, promotion, advertising that we do to highlight that trifecta and then punch it with always good as our tag, as our positioning as a brand, OK? Sometimes, depending on what you're doing, you need to dial it up uh, some of the trifectas, right? There are, there, are, there are times where health is very important, so we want to be sure that we dial it up a little bit. And there are other times when you need to dial it down, right? For example, we were talking about food service, right? Uh, in food service, we love healthy um, um, uh, recipes and salads, nothing against them, but, uh, but burgers is a great opportunity. And I love indulgence, right, uh, for, for the brand as well. So in that time, we need to dial it down a little bit. So we play with the trifecta depending on that. But always good is always front and center as a, as a brand message, as a position, as a tag for the brand. Excellent. I think you may have to work a little bit with the always like fun and good with Tide. But <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'll get some good ideas out of that. I have another question right here. Hi, um, I know that there was an Avo eatery here in Trinity Groves in Dallas. Unfortunately, I never got to attend, but whenever I was talking to my roommate about coming to this lecture, I was telling her they're coming, and she was telling me all about it. Yeah. And I was wondering what direct um, effects you saw from opening up those locations, and what was the motivation behind doing that? Yeah, um, it's, it was 100% a marketing play for us. Um, and it actually worked great because uh, part of the regulations that we have with the USDA is that I cannot receive any type of funds or money from anyone that is not my parent company. That's a 100% a law, right? So that means that I can, I can create a restaurant, but I cannot sell anything, right? So in our case, what we did is, is look for an operator that was Trinity Groves. You're 100% right. Um, and Trinity Groves took the, the whole operation. But what we did was to take over the marketing, the name, the recipe creation, and all the PR around it. So for us, it was great because I needed that PR bump. So the first, the first year really was amazing for us on, on, on PR because it was new. No one else has done it. Uh, it was delicious. We took advantage of it big time. But then after the second year, there was no new news right, uh, for us. So that's why it was not a marketing machine anymore, and we stepped out of it. Right? I, I, I do believe that I would love to go back to a restaurant. It's not easy to find an operator that will be working with us because it's, it's sometimes hard to dominate part of the business but not the other. Right? Um, so I don't know if we're going to find it, but if we can, we'll be back in the restaurant business. Great question. We have one more from next door, and then I'll top over there. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, first, my name is Lynn. I have a question on. I noticed that avocado from Mexico have taken a lot of risk within um, building the brand. I was wondering what is the, for lack of a better term, the worst risk you have taken, and what is something you learned from them? The, the worst risk? Yes, sir. Oh, that's easy. Um, <laughs> uh, I started in avocados from Mexico um, 
in January 2014. My first board meeting was in May 2014. My first idea that I took to the board was, let's pay four and a half million dollars for 30 seconds in the Super Bowl. <laughs> that was risky. I had two choices. They're going to either throw me out of the window, right, or accept this. And I, and I sold it, right? Uh, but I, I sold it because we had a good strategy behind it. Uh, we knew that people were going to be um, watching the game with guacamole because we already were a very important product at that time. We knew about this, this passion that they have around football. Right? There's, a, there's a love between football and avocados that, that we love and we, we, we nurture as much as possible. But then we had this Super Bowl effect thing that I was talking about, right? right. People were going to pay attention. And we are, at that time of the year, the only brand that is present. Because I told you, this is the only origin in the world that can produce avocados the whole year. So in January, 98 to 99% of the avocados in the US are Mexican. So it was a perfect, it was a perfect um, uh, uh, sell for, for that, but it was, it was risky, uh, definitely, for my first meeting. Yeah, big time, but it worked. Excellent, and okay. we've got a question over here. I knew from over there. There you go. Thank you. Alvaro, buenas noches. Buenas noches. Uh, regarding the revenue generated by the Super Bowl ads, compared to the AI strategy, which okay. one do you think will uh, create a better uh, revenue, and we, that revenue will aid you best? Uh, sorry, you guys need to speak louder, but uh, the, the, you're talking about revenues uh, of the yeah, Super Bowl compared to the, the AI thing that we just did? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's very different, right? Because the Super Bowl, um, it's, it's a stage that is, that is it's different. Pe people pay attention to, to you in a different way, right? So when you're not in the Super Bowl, you can be very successful. This year, don't get me wrong, we did billions of impressions in PR and, and, in, and in digital, but it's not the same as, as when you are part of that stage, right? Uh, I always use an analogy when I'm talking about the Super Bowl. It's like, imagine that, that you are a boxer and not a great boxer, right? You, you, might, you might make it to the 12 rounds, but you will never win that fight, right? Uh, but for whatever reason, in round seven, you're gonna become Mike Tyson, just for that round. What are you going to do? I'm gonna knock that guy in front of me in round seven. That's what I'm gonna do, right? That's the way that Super Bowl works for us. Uh, throughout the year, we do a lot of great marketing campaigns, we do a lot of activities, but when it comes to the moment, that's the one that I cannot miss, right? So. The revenue on the Super Bowl is very different, right? You're, you're talking about, like I told you, the last Super Bowl, 15 billion impressions in one campaign, right? So, so the value of, uh, of four, five or six million dollars of an ad in, in that kind of impressions and that kind of engagement is, is nothing, right? Uh, when you're not in the Super Bowl, you need to try to be as tricky as possible and try to bring new things to the table. And that's where AI worked very well for us. Now we have a tool that we're gonna use in Cinco de Mayo, we're gonna use throughout the summer, but the perfect time to launch it was the Super Bowl because people were asking why we were not in the Super Bowl, so that's a great moment to, to sell it in. Excellent, and I think we have a question here from one of our esteemed professors, uh, Gordon Law, but also, also owner of Swimming Duck, so. Thank you, Kerry. Good evening. So since 2014, a tremendous string of successes. There had to be a fail, maybe a monumental fail in there somewhere. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Assuming you had one. Yeah, uh, okay, yes, um, that, that's, that, that always comes. And, and, and it's, it's important because uh, you need to learn from, from your mistakes, right? And uh, I think that one, that one that we did, and, and I truly believe in it, and actually I, I do believe a little bit in, in it still, is that um, we thought at some point that we, we could create our own first party data uh, for, for, uh, for avocados from Mexico. Um, people loved, love avocados. And, uh, and our thinking was, okay, if they love avocados, we can create this, this, this base of fans around our brand that then we can use and target in media. Uh, we knew that cookies were, were going away. We knew that third party was not the thing for the future. So first party was the one that we wanted to develop. We work in that seven years, three or four different agencies until we said this, this is not the thing, right? Uh, why? Because 
we we cannot compete with uh, service companies, for example, uh, that that they have uh, loyalty programs because you care about that, right? I'm a, I'm a I'm a huge Starbucks fan, for example, and I I follow big time their their loyalty program. Why? Because I love Starbucks and they gave me free coffees, right? But when you're an avocado that we don't sell anything, keeping those consumers engaged in a database was very complicated. So we end up using the learnings uh, to create our own hybrid. And we have right now what we call a second party data approach where we created our own segmentation. We're targeting specific uh, groups through this second party segmentation and it's working. We, we, we just saw some numbers that are moving the needle. So we're very happy with it. But it was a big learning and a big fail for the company not to be able to do it. And our last question will come from <laughs> Lauren. To this guy. But I, works at Loomis. I work for the Loomis agency. We're a challenger brand agency based in Dallas. Nice. This isn't a question. This is an idea because I love crazy ideas. There you go. Have you seen the Oscar Mayer Wiener mobile that goes across America? Yes. Mm -hmm. You need an avocado mobile to go across. <laughs> Woo! <America>. Yes. <laughs> That's free. I'm gonna I'm gonna respond back with something <laughs> even crazier. Okay. Um, and I, I, we've, been, we've been thinking about it, and I'm telling you, you're going to see it at some point. Remember this day when you see it, OK? We're not going to have an avocado mobile. We're going to have an avocado air balloon that is going to go around the country, right? Um, there's a, there's, we're close at some point, um, and the shape is perfect to do a, a nice uh, air balloon experience. Um, and we can really capture a lot of attention if we do it right. So um, uh, it's coming. And uh, remember this day uh, when we see it. Okay? And that will go really well with College Bowl as well, which you've exactly. headed into. So, yes. okay. So we're going to look up and see avocado. Yeah, when you see it in there, you will remember that you, that you knew about it. Don't tell anyone. All right. And <laughs> just before we end tonight, I, can you give us one? So we've got some students, we've got industry here, but I'm going more for the students here. You started your career. Yeah. What advice, looking back now, and given our current uh, situation that we're in, what kind of advice would you give to them? What's one of your one great piece of advice? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story for that one. Um, uh, when I started college in Costa Rica, um, I went to Universidad de Costa Rica there. That is the most important university there. Pretty tough to get in there. Uh, not everyone gets. and. I got in, took the full uh, classes, full semester, uh, and the second semester in my college, I decided that I wanted to work full time. So I was working full time, uh, studying uh, like crazy. I didn't have a car at that time, so I was traveling two buses to go back and forth from my work that, that I was in a travel agency at that time um, and, and go back to the university. And at that time, we, we read newspapers. I don't know if you know that. What, what is that, right? Um, so I, I remember opening the newspaper, and there was an ad that Scott Paper Company, that was the most important paper company in Central America. At that time, Kimberly Clark was second. Scott Paper was number one before they bought it. Um, uh, was one in, uh, looking for a, a merchandising um, um, supervisor. Uh, and I said, I'm going to apply. I have no experience whatsoever. I was in a in second like, semester in college, never worked. Uh, uh, I was working, like I told you, in, a, in, a, in an advertising agency, in, in a travel agency. And, and, and they called me for an interview. And I remember that day, right, saying like half an hour before I left, I'm not going to go. What am I going to say? I have no experience. I have nothing to offer these guys. It's going to be a, an embarrassment to go to the, uh, to the uh, interview. And at the end, I said, I'll do it. And I, and I went, and I got the job. Um, and, uh, and I was 19 years old, and now I was boss of 20 people. Uh, and I now had a car, and I was studying full time in, in my university, and my career took off. So um, I was, from that moment in time, always the young guy in the group. Uh, from every corporation, every country that I move on, when I got to executive teams, I was always the youngest, the youngest, and the youngest, and the youngest, because I started young. Uh, and it's hard, guys, when you get there and you have a lot of gray hair and a lot of uh, experience around you. But if you believe in yourselves, 
If you have that passion, being young is a great, is a great opportunity uh, because you're going to learn, you're going to be more flexible, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have a lot of strength and a lot of passion and a lot of muscle to win whatever you want. So start young, don't be afraid, believe in yourselves, okay? Wonderful. Thank you so right. much, everybody. Yes. Thank you. And I believe we still have a little bit of food out there. And so we'll go out there and you can all keep continuing to talk about the wonderful things we've learned. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol. Woohoo! Thank you Appreciate so it. much. Thank oh you. my gosh. Okay. Wonderful. I mean, that's